Here we are, Mark. Good Hi, to be with you. Hey, thank you so much. How are you? Oh, pretty good. <laughs> the jet lag? Like, yeah, the Bali, Fiji, Fiji, LA, and well, it's a lot. I'm right there with you yeah, all the way from Perth. Perth is even longer. Here Great we are. to connect with you in LA again, yeah, all wonderful. the way over here. I now, last, yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted us to dive straight into a conversation that you often bring to the table. The, uh, the very common divide, the misperception between seekers thinking to choose either God or sex. Oh. <laughs> and for us just to pick that apart, because it's a common dogma, a common predicament yeah. that often can get real messy. Yeah. Could you speak to that a little? Whatever and comes out is perfect. I find it very perfect. interesting even with young people when you begin to discuss this matter. They will say to you, well, isn't it one or the other? <laughs> you know, that the uh, patriarchy of religious doctrine that's been in place now for uh, <clears throat> 2,000 years or more uh, has made this assumption based on some the Samkhya early philosophy is that you get to God, Purusha, via somehow conquering Prakriti by having victory over the seen condition. You know? For listeners that don't know what Prakriti is, could you... Well, uh... <clears throat> this ancient philosophical idea that there is the absolute condition, consciousness, that somebody might call God, and it is arising as all materiality, <clears throat> all visibility, you know, all planets, all life. <clears throat> so that sort of became the basis of uh, religious thinking, that we overcome this world, overcome materiality, overcome appearance to get to the source of appearance, right, is a deeply held um, axiom of thought structure of, the, of societies, mm -hmm. not just Christian, but particularly Christian. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you, to get to God, you drop all things. You get away from women. You get to the monastery. You concentrate on <laughs> what is higher. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that has created um, hierarchy in society where if you're a serious person, you get to the monastery. Or the other versions, you meditate a lot. You go within and away from. You conquer your desires. And this has created this vulgarity and misery around the male-female collaboration, mm -hmm. which is clearly the power of life itself. <laughs> You 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 have a four month old beautiful baby. You know how did that happen? Mm -hmm. You know, so, so m my line is that sex is the methodology of God. Mm -hmm. You know, the is the absolute reality is arising as male and female in perfect harmony, in perfect union, and it is the basis of all appearance. All life is that. Right? So this is the area that we must bring some clarity to now in our personal lives and in the public life. Mm -hmm. You know, This old uh, patriarchal doctrinal system of trying to get to truth or God or the absolute by conquering materiality, by going beyond... Uh, the movement of energy, the movement of set, the movement of prakriti, um, is uh, is false. <laughs> it's a cultural fault. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work, and that that has been put in our thought structures. You know, it wasn't my idea. <laughs> we were born into that idea, mm -hmm. and we absorbed that idea. So there's great confusion around that. There's definitely there are traditions of clear recognition that the male-female collaboration is the means to realizing uh, the absolute condition of reality. You know, through the union of opposites, we 
realize the source of opposites is quite a counter teaching <laughs> to the teachings of the patriarchal doctrine, which mm-hmm. is to drop the need for union in the seen condition, in this born condition. So, yeah, where do you see how that came up into someone's attention, a group of people's attention? Do you think it was because sexual energy and relationship is so potentially distracting? Because it is. You know, having a newborn is absolutely ecstatic and it's beautiful, but it's definitely distracting. So uh, there I am trying to just sit with God. And if I am attached to that notion that God is something external to me or some anthropomorphic figure and then here is this crying baby. Mm. It's just distracting in a way. Mm. And if we haven't been taught or we haven't had the the divine realization that, oh my God, like, wow, this being is God, I am God, here we are. And even... Even if they're screaming that that is God screaming, it's distracting if we're clinging to like the the model that God is just in the silence, just in yeah, in, just yeah, <laughs> only there in the silence, right? Because not in the screaming baby, yeah. Because even in yoga, there is a a pretty dominant model of trying to push away all distraction, yeah. you know, escaping, yeah. escaping yeah. the world of sensory distraction yeah. and just getting into the yeah. cave, being with myself, Definitely. being with God. See, there is that confusion there that, that Hinduism and Vedanta were the, sort of the bed of your, the, the culture that was the uh, bed or the, where yoga was held mm. in, that, in that cultural perspective. So yoga has been mixed up with that view and confused mm-hmm. with that view of uh, dropping everything, mm-hmm. of residing as witness only to all arising conditions mm-hmm. is a very you know, dearly held view in among yogis. Mm-hmm. And so this can, that assumption can still be in you mm. and still cause conflict. And I don't mean you personally, but I also big mean you. you personally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all people uh, who have sex, who have families, mm. uh, it puts in them, in, into them a conflict. of They want to be in the, the all-pervading consciousness, stillness, <laughs> reside as witness only to all arising conditions. Mm. And yet the baby is crying. <laughs> yet, you know, my woman has very real needs right now to be cared for, for income, you know, mm-hmm. for survival, for a place to live, for food on the table. <laughs> um, and the crying baby needs uh, support right now, right now. <laughs> <laughs> and yet what about my all-pervading consciousness. So it's definitely challenging, for sure. (laughs) Yeah. So it's kind of easier to just come up with the story that all of that is too distracting. Yeah, get to the monastery where the real stuff's happening. And I mean, the story even says that that, that's what Buddha did as well, you know. He he had a young baby and left the family to (laughs) seek enlightenment. So it's very thick in um, the model of seeking, of seeking enlightenment. Yeah, it's very misogynist, isn't mm -hmm. it? That he left his wife and family to... I wonder how they got on. (laughs) (laughs) It's not included in the story. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but my... My line is that, you know, he should have stayed in the palace and used his resource as royalty to mm. feed the people. <laughs> right. But he had to have <laughs> the, uh, bring the download yoga. first, the inside yeah, first. Yeah. And bring this matter of it is intimacy with all ordinary conditions which reveals the source of all conditions. You know, this is the, this is the, um, the 180 degree uh, difference in direction here in yoga Mm -hmm. by merging with my object with my chosen object I know the object but in so knowing the object I know the knower of the object (laughs) Um, but nirod you see it is chosen chitta vritti nirod nirod is choice 
to go in my directions of choice with continuity, then I know consciousness itself, then mm. I know the knower, is a very clear and dominant instruction in Yoga Sutra. Right? Uh, and paradoxically, in that process of yoga, going in your directions with continuity, your chosen directions, then the siddhis or the gifts of uh, residing as consciousness relative to all things just comes. You can't make it come. Mm -hmm. You can't take heaven by storm. You can't force it as a practice and try to uh, reject ordinary <clears throat> seen reality, mm -hmm. tangible conditions. You can't bypass tangible conditions for this idea of God. And you see, that attempt to bypass all ordinary conditions has been the monastic way of Buddhism and Christianity and Hinduism and all doctrinal patriarchal systems. And it's caused this trouble to humanity. It's put, in, put us in conflict with sex. It's... it's put male in conflict with female, female in con conflict with male. And clearly in Mother Nature that's not happening. The, in Mother Nature, male and female are a perfect collaboration that is the nurturing force of life itself. You know, there was male and there was female <clears throat> and you two came together and in your perfect union, your perfect harmony, from that in the deep mystery of being of existence came your baby like how can you account for that it created in that instant the mother father flow the nurturing flow of existence and one cell appeared that now is 16 billion cells and what a wonder <laughs> what a beauty you know what god <laughs> mm. is that and then the baby comes out and God is crying and needs to be fed and you need a circumstance, a home. And that is all God's, you know, the, <clears throat> the ultimate reality arising. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> and this is the difference <clears throat> in yoga, what I call the primordial practices of humanity before these religious doctrinal ideas were stamped or imposed on society and created hierarchy in society where if you were still in the village having sex and having families, you were considered to be in a lesser position than the heroes who had gone to the monastery and were concentrating on God mm -hmm. and became the rulers of Europe, the womenless men who ruled Europe and created the power structures of Europe that then came into America that is the power structure of America. This. And we're just finally starting to look at the absurdity of all that. Starting to. Yeah. Clearly, male and female are equal and opposite. Mm -hmm. In collaboration, <clears throat> where one empowers the other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is so powerful that it produces new life, not that it has to produce actual <clears throat> new life, but it produces life, you know, it produces a third, a power. Mm -hmm. And um, we need to see through that hoax that's been put on humanity. And when we do <clears throat> see through it, then we can start to make something of our life. And I, you know, I say, and this is the God realizing process. The principle of yoga is by the union of opposite, by participating in the union of opposites that are clearly, utterly established. There, it's already the case, mm -hmm. but my participation in that reveals the source of both, right? Reveals this Purusha, not in the conquering of or the victory over desire, but the um, the participation in, de in desire mm. to go in my directions of choice with continuity, where the crying baby means it's not uh, obstructing your God vision. It is your God vision. 
<laughs> to yeah. go to the baby and look after the baby, take care of ordinary circumstance, and in yoga, and then I know the knower. Then I know mm. consciousness itself. So this conflict um, can dissolve and needs to dissolve. What do you think of the uh, age-old term renunciation actually being the renouncing of our selfishness? I remember that being a, a, a refreshing translation of a lot of the age-old teachings of yoga, that renunciation isn't a renouncing of right. the mundane and the world and our sensory experience, yeah. but actually just a renunciation yeah. of our <clears throat> egocentric it, it could be selfishness. The, re- the renunciation of our selfishness to sit in this cave. <laughs> right. That can be <laughs> incredibly selfish. <laughs> well, the selfishness, I need to do my meditation, renounce that and get on with life and, mm. and handle uh, all ordinary conditions yeah. of life. And you know, you, you do know that in, you know, in that intimacy with life, with with your wife, with your family, there does arise this feeling of fullness, of completeness that might even turn into some quiet moments of, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> of peace. Yeah, when Ramdas we- married us, he he said, "You're both on a you're on a tandem path to God," and that that has been like a a constant revisit for us when things are getting really busy and stressful yeah. and. The stress of responsibility becomes too distracting to come yeah. back to that core teaching. You're on this tandem path to God. Yeah. And relationship, yes, can be one of the most, uh, quote unquote, advanced forms of yoga, apparently. But if we're both able to see that we're both the guru in disguise, <laughs> we can just both keep reminding each other. Definitely. But I, I think that can be challenging in the stresses of life to keep. Yeah. To keep, come on, back here. <laughs> yeah. And to look at, look at the beauty of the ordinary. I think there's a pretty thick residue in modern day seeking, whether it be yoga or tantra or whatever, that the mundane is old paradigm and yeah. everything has got to be utopian and wild and pew, which it is when we get down to it and actually pay attention. Yeah. But even the ordinary is. So, um, yeah, I think it's a pr- very, very valuable teaching yeah. to pay attention even to the ordinary, even to the absolute shit, like the shit of life. Um, yeah, you got to handle it. Yeah, rather than just seeking uh, yeah. the wild and, and just yeah. the sensory ecstatic. So I want us just to touch upon the kind of other polarity of what we just spoke about and the kind of neo-tantric movement where there seems to be a, a clinging to that, a sensory, uh, yeah. just a constant wild, constant sensory utopian experience. And then anything mundane, anything uh, challenging, anything distracting, kind of putting that away, which is like the yeah. flip of the old monastic model. I want to tell you that it's more, it's another form of patriarchy. Mm-hmm. It's another form of male control. This whole idea that the guru, the teacher is somebody senior, somebody in authority, even a knower, is the problem. What we call the social dynamic of disempowerment, that there's somebody knows who has some arbitrary technique, Mm -hmm. some arbitrary yoga, some meditation, some religious point of view or whatever, and then everybody doesn't know and they sit in that social dynamic of disempowerment trying to know what the knower knows. Mm. This is how patriarchy works. In yoga, there is no such thing. The teacher, the guru, is no more than a friend and no less than a friend. Right? And I want to point out that the ancient world of Veda, in which yoga appeared and evolved over thousands of years, there was no such thing as this arrangement of guru as a social authority, as a socially superior person, as a perfect person. There was no such thing. Mm. This happened later from 500 BC onwards where they gave seniority to such a person. And in that Veda, 
Uh, it was called the Dashanam culture, the, the culture of seeing, the culture of relationship. The deity and the guru and God and your spouse and your body are one <laughs> arising in the same reality, and that is all. There is no hierarchy to that arrangement that I just said. God, guru, deity, spouse, mm. body, <laughs> and the body's relationship to the whole elemental world of light and air and the green realm and water <laughs> and any yet unseen uh, source of arising, <laughs> source of creation. Mm. It was all one. That's all. And the yoga was your participation in that through guru, deity, spouse, body, elemental world. It was a, a culture of relationship, of free relating to what is, to reality itself. That definitely was called God, you know. And that's what it was. The idea came later of uh, this, this hoax of you get to God through the exclusive agency of a perfect person. The perfect person implies that everybody else and everything else is not yet perfect. And then you get to this perfection by denying the ordinary mm -hmm. life. And in these systems, the individuality is taken off a person. The unique appearance of each beautiful person is denied, destroyed, and this absurdity of everybody uh, looking the same and acting the same and in the hoax of the institution of the perfect person and taking away sex, and taking away male-female uh, collaboration as equals and opposites, where one empowers the other. <laughs> Mm. in the one reality that is arising as all of us. Yeah. So I'm reminded too, Stuart, I went to Perth, your home, and I, was, I met an Aboriginal man. It was a beautiful meeting. And he said to me, he was describing his lifestyle, he said, some of us decide to become Christians, us people. He said, but for those of us who decide to become Christians... Uh, Jesus, well, he's not the boss of us. He is one of us, is what the indigenous man in Australia said. And it, you know, it affirmed that this is uh, deeply held in uh, true culture, in indigenous culture, you know, the cultures of, that have evolved over <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of years, is that uh, wisdom transmission doesn't occur in a hierarchy, doesn't occur in, a, in an assumption of seniority. You know, the guru is no more than a friend, no less than a friend. It's uh, the arising of uh, the nurturing force of life in local community. And furthermore, the guru is not there to create followers or create power. Uh, the guru was not... Um, there for his or her own continuity. The guru was there for the moksha of the student, for the liberation of the student. And it's an interesting matter that when that liberation occurred for an individual, then the guru function dissolved. It wasn't needed anymore. <laughs> yeah. And there was no clinging on to trying to be, a, you know, a teacher, trying to be a famous person with followers. All you get is followers. Mm -hmm. We've had many examples of that in recent times. Even J. Krishnamurti, he had followers. <laughs> and all the followers were frustrated because they couldn't seem to get to where he was allegedly at. And he was frustrated because no one understood him. So this... This social dynamic of disempowerment needs to dissolve for yoga to be there. Mm -hmm. And then we're all just friends together in the same reality, in the same wonder, and everybody is the power of the cosmos. Everybody is the unspeakable beauty of life arising, everybody, you know. And that's what is communicated in yoga culture. It is the 
way beyond this maya that humanity has got into with the imposition of hierarchy on society you know it's we i think we can see through it in our own personal lives it's like what look out <laughs> that didn't work <laughs> that's not working is it so what do i choose yeah i choose intimacy with my life my own body and breath and all ordinary conditions of my life including my spouse including my babies <laughs> including my work in the world you know all ordinary conditions and this uh, you know to make something of is what my teacher used to say like make something of your life with the god-given skills of your life mm -hmm. you know and that includes your relational skills and your ability to enter into uh, sexual intimacy as love as honesty mm -hmm. you know as real uh, commitment to life in the directions that you've chosen this this is yoga and this reveals the absolute condition of reality itself not by denying those conditions you know, which has been put in us so the whole conflict uh, you know sometimes it takes a little while it might take a few years for that conflict to dissolve for mm -hmm. those of us who have been seriously impressed by patriarchal religious systems. Mm. You know, it puts us in conflict with our own individuality and our own sex. Well, there seems to be a, a paradox there as well in which, say, a student is coming to you and they're in a class. It would seem on the surface that there is kind of like a hierarchy, like on the surface, like um, students that have been coming to you for years and then you're leading – the yeah. class, like it would yeah. seem like, okay, you're, you're right. the boss, you're leading. Yeah. But then if you pay close enough attention, you, there, there's yeah. that paradoxical authority, like you're, you're leading and you're guiding and you're giving methodology. At the same time, that's constantly crumbling away. And that, that seems like the, what seems like paradoxical, right. but the, 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 the merging in which yeah. there's a container, a safe container, and then some instruction, yeah. and, but then that crumbles away into yeah. into friendship and the actual uh, realization that we're all one. Yeah. But uh, you seem to embody that really beautifully because you would be considered by many a guru, definitely a master teacher. Many would consider you a guru, mm. yet there's a crumbling away of the yeah. old the old uh, concept of that, that guru model. Can you speak well, to I that? Well, I wouldn't a say a crumbling away. I'm saying okay. a throwing away. Throwing away. <laughs> well, it's still here, so well, <laughs> it seems I to know be what you mean about the, the, the appearance of, you know. But the teachers that I've met who mm. are actually teachers, who, who are gurus, um, have uh, emphatically and uh, dramatically uh, deconstruct that model mm. around them. I don't want to have anything to do with it because it is seen as the problem itself. We are very really uh, all in the same condition. Mm. You know, my teacher used to say it never crosses my mind that I'm any different from anybody else or anything else, you know. And after a while, it, it dawned on me that he actually that was his experience. He didn't feel any different from anybody. And um, that's, that's the key to the whole matter, that, you know, we, that we you know, urgently dissolve that for ourselves and for our friends and our students. This is not working. This system doesn't. Nobody is less than anybody else. You cannot be second to anything. This is a socially contrived criteria that's being put on us. The whole idea of being a winner or a loser is to what some arbitrary criteria that is contrived in the minds and the thought structures of, of society in many, many different forms, including spiritual language and, as well as the secular language. There are no winners, there's no losers, there's life itself. <laughs> there is no process 
required. We are in the one reality that is arising as all of us. And in that, we definitely enter into friendships, into intimate connection to each other that are very dear and very important to us. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, uh, deity, guru, spouse, <laughs> and all of the elemental world are arising in one reality. So there's definitely dearness, the dash, and I'm, I, you know, I see my spouse. I'm in love with my spouse. I'm in love with this tree. I'm in love with the birds singing. I'm in love with my guru, who is not my authority. He's not my boss. <laughs> He's my friend, tangibly and actually. Uh, this is what we must now plant in societies everywhere and bring, bring that principle to yoga teaching all over this world where there's, we have very real teachers and good teachers who go into local community <clears throat> and give the self-empowering tools of intimacy uh, with life for all people. It includes male, female, whether, and I must say whether that's same-sex intimacy or opposite-sex intimacy, it's the same, and give the, um, the tools of uh, intimate connection to the tangible conditions of reality. And that is the function of guru. So it's just a local hmm. uh, phenomena of nurturing. If there's any appearance of there being a facilitator that's a senior person, then that must be uh, addressed and put put aside mm -hmm. because that model doesn't work. That model is the problem itself. It implies that you are less and you have to become more through whatever the arbitrary religious methods or the yoga methods or the meditation methods or the sex methods, which mainly is to give up sex, become celibate, uh, or have a lot of exaggerated sex, this neo-tantra nonsense that's uh, popped its head up, you know. That's just more manipulation of people. You know, if I'm using you as some sort of body to stimulate my pranas and go into some subtle state, you know, it's, it's abuse of you, denial of you. But if I love you by body and name <laughs> and flesh, uh, I, if I love you, I can't then tell the difference between you and God. I cannot to love you. you know? <laughs> and then sexual intimacy could arise in that. You know, Whatever the sexual arrangement is, whatever the gender identity is, uh, you know, whatever the sexual preference is, to love somebody tangibly as the body, then that's the tantra. The loving, the relationship itself is the, is the yoga, is the God realization, not the manipulation of the energies of the body. This is silly. This is baby yoga. It's infantile. And, but I know that's being taught. I know there's a lot of talk about sacred sex and books on sacred sex and all the rest of it. But if it's not the yoga of intimacy, if I'm not intimate with my body, my breath, and this body's relatedness to its own experience, uh, then the, this is just fanciful talk. It's a kind of pornography, you know. Mm -hmm. It stimulates the mind into more desires, you know, spiritual desires, but it's denying... Uh, life itself it's very theatrical and yeah. it's incredible how spiritual language languaging can be weaved into pretty much anything and yeah. i think that's how this neo-tantric thing has uh taken off because exquisite poetic uh languaging can be brought in and these radical spiritual truths can be implemented but it's such like a... pornographic magazines mm -hmm. it gets you excited you can, I state emphatically that there's no tantra without hatha yoga. Mm -hmm. Hatha asana pranayama is the mother's milk of tantric culture. Mm -hmm. There had to be intimacy with your own embodiment before you could realize any intimacy mm -hmm. with uh, life itself and all aspects of life, including sexuality. Mm -hmm. And the main theme of this right now, of course, is 
that asana is hatha yoga, the union of ha and ta, the union of strength with receptivity, the union of male and female aspects of life in your own embodiment. And the <clears throat> inhalation is this receptivity through the crown and frontal line all the way to the base of the body, to the genitals. And the male has been programmed to get the feminine and control the feminine, uh, to have access to the feminine through control. Right? This is a universal thing that, <clears throat> that the patriarchal doctrine has created in human behaviors. And I'm saying now we must go to the primordial practice <laughs> prior to the patriarchy and learn to receive. And in yoga practice, asana done correctly for each individual, this receptivity is at least half the equation of the asana. And, and in the tantric traditions, it's actually slightly more important mm. to receive. The feminine is slightly more important than mere strength. So asana tangibly uh, sort of reconditions uh, the nervous system, uh, tangibly refines each individual's ability to receive. Then even the male penetration becomes only in the context of receptivity, you know, with respect, receiving, sensitivity, uh, and then becomes useful. There's so much to say about that. You know, the Shiva Lingam it is anciently worshipped as God in India and still is. It's a holy sign. While the Lingam is not penetrating the Yoni, the feminine, the Lingam is arising from the feminine, right? And I say, you know, uh, males, we all came from mother. We all came from our mothers. And we are half feminine, you know, in our makeup. Uh, so our intimate practice with somebody else is this receptive participation in the feminine. Intimacy with sensitivities love of <laughs> mm. and this is a rare experience for people in the ordinary world of sex which is all organized around the male penetration and the ejaculation and the the ending of the male desire you know and it's a horror you know the normal is terrible mm. and we must become receptive through actual uh, practice and not the exaggerations of the studio yoga business that's become sort of a gymnastic it was more male uh, it's more patriarchy actually but uh, actual yoga where uh, receptivity is half the asana the inhalation the, the uh, strength of the base and spine mm. is able to receive synchronistically Look, I went to a festival in, here in California and I was asked to facilitate a men's group. It was so interesting. There was a lot of men there, 50 men or so. About half of those men had, were proudly saying, I am celibate. And in a religious kind of framework of thought. Now, this was at Bhakti Fest. And they said, since I've become celibate, my life is so much better. I'm so much more conscious. <laughs> Um, and they were sort of congratulating themselves in this decision that they've made. The other half were telling their stories about how dreadful their lives were with, with sex, mm. you see, <laughs> and the failures and the, their, their women who were <laughs> mm. angry at them and their sex that was not particularly satisfying for them or their women, you see. Mm. And I just, I could see there's this oscillating. You either give up sex and feel, you know, religiously high for a while, or you try to go and do sex and feel miserable. <laughs> and we oscillate between those two. Mm -hmm. And so we began to have this discussion that we're having now about intimacy with life and the ability to receive. 
uh, that yoga gives, you know, the, to receive through the crown and frontal line of the body, e- even the genitals becoming uh, a receptive in their activity. And uh, it was like a real eye opener. For, you know, I said, all the men who were celibate, I said, please, you know, you're young and pumping. You know, Mother Nature has this very strong need to participate in the male-female polarities of life as life itself and um, learn how to do that as religious practice, as, as a spiritual life, as a life. And for the men who were having troubles in their relationship, to receive, receive the, the women. Mm. <laughs> receive to an ultimate degree, because that's how all life is. You know, Life is strength, male, that is utterly receptive. And so you look at a tree that has a trunk, strong male ascending, but you get to the soft foliage and it's utterly, utterly soft and juicy and receptive, receiving nutrients, you know. Without the foliage, the trunk would wither. Without the trunk, there could be no foliage. It's one system. And so, so participate in this and turn it around. You know, conventional sexing is a waste of time and conventional celibacy is a waste of time. That might be necessary for, you know, I'm not, if you've been involved in the usual life for a while, it could be good to mm-hmm. set sit back for those austerities so, yeah for yeah. A, a year or two or seven years but not to turn it into a mm-hmm. permanent um glamorized yeah i'd like to speak practice. to the celibacy thing just for a bit because i i went through a phase of it myself mm. but now look at you <laughs> well it wasn't it wasn't forced. now you're in trouble <laughs> <laughs> totally um but it wasn't forced. It was very interesting because I, I was incredibly sexually active until this particular time in which I just what was going. So it was a period of being single, just mm-hmm. very naturally had broken up with a long-term relationship, mm-hmm. was going deeper and deeper into my yoga sadhana, was doing regular trips to India, just very, very deep in my own singular path. And just very organically, I stopped feeling the need for sex just for this period of yeah. about two or three years. And, um, and of course, in the yoga scene, there lots of beautiful women around. There was just no attraction. There was no mm. urge. Yet I felt more peaceful than I ever had. Mm. So, f- for that period, I really got the celibacy thing in mm. which it feels it can't be forced, but mm-hmm. I have, do feel there's a, sp- a place for it. Like yeah. if the central axis is clear and you're just in your heart yeah. and there's not that polarity being met in which yeah. uh, the, that natural spark in which you meet the person you're meant to just yeah. have a beautiful time with or make yeah. babies with or whatever, there wasn't that. It was just a beautiful union yeah. within. Yeah. And that went for close to three years, I think, until I met Joe. Mm. And um, we just had a beautiful uh, mystical meeting in which we saw Soleil, our our daughter, Mm. and and it was just undeniable that we were meant to make love and be together and make a baby. It was a mystical, undeniable experience. But I really do feel if it wasn't for that three years or whatever of, of... very simple, deep yoga practice, clearing, mm-hmm. clearing my energies, and just connecting to my own inner union. I don't, I don't think I would have been ready to dive into this kind of yeah. relationship. Like to be mm-hmm. with an empowered other, mm-hmm. it's beautiful, but mm-hmm. it's intense as well. Mm-hmm. It's intense, and I just want to speak to that a little bit because uh, finding, especially in LA. A lot of like um, Joe's friends that, you know, mid 30s and mid 40s to that kind of range are really having trouble finding an, an empowered other that can't meet them. So um, I really do feel that time of inner work, inner sadhana, mm-hmm. kind of going into the cave a little yeah. was really valuable yeah. to pull back from the world to become more masterful with my sexual energy, to learn to bring it up to the heart, to bring it up into the crown, everything that you're speaking of. Then as soon as I met Joel, we could actually meet. 
we could actually meet. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And it was beautiful. And, Love thy and, neighbor as thyself. And it was the most peak experience I'd ever had that moment of meeting her mm. and then that, that few months that, that came from there of making Soleil essentially. But then the challenges that came after that of her parents dying and us caretaking for them, I speak a lot about it because that felt like real integration and bringing all that bliss and union mm. and, and breakthrough into um, all these kinds of challenges that yeah. were both blissful and bringing up a baby and challenging and caretaking yeah. for the, these people well, dying. These are the and, real things of life, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Uh, sex and birth and survival, and death. The, the Buddhists saw were also terrible. They invented the idea of permanent renunciation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Krishnamacharya, our teacher, would say there was never such a thing in yogic culture. And this creating this structure in life, these institutions of folk who had were apparently the heroes who had permanently renounced sex (laughs) and survival and death were the superior people. That If you're still in the society struggling with those things, you were considered to be less, right? And this is how sex became such an aberrated vulgar matter because it was denied. So it came out as vulgar activity, you know, as lesser activity. So being born into the society, of course, we get caught up in this the sort of the normal patterns of aberrated sex habits. And I agree that we have to drop that for a while. (laughs) Maybe seven years, you know, in the tradition of this Brahmacharya time Mm -hmm. of seven years under where you were there for to learn about relationship, Mm -hmm. you know, under the uh, guidance of your elder. And but in time you would definitely then enter into, you know, by about the age of 28, you would enter into a lifelong intimacy mm-hmm. based on some clear understanding <laughs> about uh, through that would develop through those brahmacharya years. Yeah, I think that is really valuable to emphasize for the for the younger, newer student that mm-hmm. is really getting a lot of ahas from what yep. you're saying, from what we're saying, but maybe isn't feeling ready for that kind of union for that kind of intimacy uh yeah. it feels like there is a time to kind of pull back and Definitely. and get a deeper yeah, you, inner practice if if you're you know you're born into the ordinary patterning of the world there must be a time of having some inspection into those pat that patterning that had gone into you mm. uh to become free of <laughs> that patterning some some quiet time mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then with clarity, with yoga, enter into intimacy with with another of your choice. So with the three L's are present that you like somebody, you love somebody, and you lust somebody. And lust is a very honorable, dignified, it is Mother Nature's activity. It's, it's there to uh, evolve the species mm-hmm. with our choices of who we are to be intimate with, you know. It's a biochemical matter. It's an evolutionary Mother Nature's matter. God's matter. <laughs> God's concern, who we lust for, in the context of love. And then proceed. Now you're right. There's in the in the modern world, especially you know in coastal America, the urban coastal cities. There's a huge problem of people in the prime of their life that cannot be met by their polar opposite. Um, And there's the weight of this spiritual persuasion that it's somehow a superior thing to do to try to go beyond sex Mm. as a lifelong decision. But it's insanity. It is a madness that has infected societies everywhere. It's like you try to hold your breath for five minutes and see what happens. You know, it comes out as a gasp, as a burst. Mm-hmm. This is what happens when you, in, in a sort of, um, with the will of mind, sort of in a motivated way, mm-hmm. try to suppress the body's natural functions. You know, it always comes out in an aberrated, uh, dreadful way. And this is 
of course, what's happening in society that we're trying to address now and aberrated sex through this and glamorizing the religious suppression of sex. Mm-hmm. You know, it's all nonsense. It's insane. I wrote down a um, quote from you down before in my phone that we've pretty much spoke of, but I, 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 it just it's so beautiful. Happiness arises when you relax into the reality of your natural condition. The secrets of the universe are already in you as you. Seeking anything implies that you don't have it. Every search for the idea of enlightenment leads you further away from it. The magnificence of life does not await you. It actually is you, which I just love. Thank you. Which, again, we've spoke so much about it already, but we can't hear it enough to keep getting pointed mm. within. And I mean, mm. there, there, there's been a constant search for happiness, for enlightenment, but uh, just to speak to everyone, even if the enlightenment word triggers a certain listener, which it, it has been, I think, misconceived, misperceived, the word enlightenment. Yeah. Um, I think it scares a lot of people. So for one, or it seduces a lot of people. Seduces or scares. Yeah, again, that polarity. (laughs) Why do you think it scares a lot of people? Well, the idea of enlightenment is a hoax perpetrated on humanity Mm -hmm. through patriarchy. Yeah, right. Again, same thing, isn't it? Yeah, Yeah. my teacher would just say there's no such thing as enlightenment. There is only life happening, Mm -hmm. as each and every one (laughs) in the one. And. If we would just relax <laughs> this ingrained effort to whether we're doing it in a tangible way, we're trying to get enlightened. Relax. I remember Ajahn Shanti saying, look at the word. It, it just means lighten up. Yeah. En- enlighten, lighten up, <laughs> relaxed. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so simple. Yeah. But then that's gone through all the structures of society. Mm-hmm. You know, we may not be thinking about enlightenment, but as I said, we're still on this some arbitrary criteria, mm-hmm. some measure of being a winner or a loser. And I think the cities that you spoke of before, the, the yogic powers, I think that intrinsically gets, uh, it's not intrinsic, but I think it tends to get associated with enlightenment, that uh, the, sure. the stories of Jesus and the stories yeah. of the, these miracle makers that yeah. have these siddhis, these yogic powers. I don't think those siddhis necessarily mean one is enlightened. Huh? <laughs> My teacher had a joke about uh, Christ went uh, out into the ocean and unfortunately for <laughs> humankind, the water was only three inches deep. <laughs> You see, he was imagined to have a siddhi. Therefore, he was like, oh, you know, he is, he is that and I am not that. Yeah. That's the problem. And, of course, it probably wasn't the teaching of Jesus at all. He was, he was teaching love thy neighbor as thyself. And he seemed to have been teaching to the ordinariness yes. of and in the world but yeah, not of to the love, world. To love each other, you know. It's his yoga construction to mm-hmm. love, love thy neighbor as thyself is to love this embodiment, love this body, this breath, and this body's mm-hmm. tangible relatedness to its own experience, mm-hmm. including the male-female collaboration, which is the power of life. So do you think there is the attraction to that old model of enlightenment, like all the powers in the world, all this… Uh, totally. Yeah. You know, we're attracted, uh, say we're seduced by enlightenment. Seduced. Or if we're not seduced, we're scared of that idea mm. and just turn our life into, you know, beer and sport or whatever, or career, you know, the bland, the middle class massage mm. of the ordinary mm. uh, despairing life, you know. So would you say enlightenment is way more ordinary than we have uh, fantasized about? Yeah, or just yeah. take it all the way. There the is way. no such thing as enlightenment. Right. Just there get is, rid of that word altogether. Yeah, there is life happening. <laughs> And I am life and you are life. And it is a wonder that will never cease. There's an eternal strength and receptivity that has arrived as this body and your body. And this is what's happening. You know. Isn't it interesting, these words, God, mm. enlightenment, even yoga, get just so confused yeah. where, where we're playing with being in the world but not of the world, these mystical, mm. deep aspects of our essential nature. I want to purify four words. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, guru, sex, yoga. 
I want to give not him, enlightenment, just chuck enlightenment. Uh, out. Yeah. <laughs> I want to bring clarity. Oh, okay, well, that can be a fifth word. Fifth one, like. yeah, I think that'd but be good. In that it's in use, but, but particularly as you started this uh, beautiful conversation, thank you. That God and sex, uh, these two most powerful words in the English language, to bring them together, and one purify the other. You know, this is what needs to happen. Mm-hmm. So when we speak of God, we, we're speaking with dignity and graciousness and not denying the seen condition, not denying individuality and sex. And when we speak of sex, we're not denying the great absolute that has arrived as sex, as life on earth, <laughs> you know, yeah. as the power of this cosmos arising as, as each one of us. What about money? What are your views on money and that whole equation? Of money is just energy. Just money energy. is the basic, honest uh, uh, transmission of energy between each other, and we must participate in it, and it must be uh, honest and real. Uh, there's no requirement for greed or hoarding of it. Uh, the patriarchal fear that's been put into humanity uses money as the principal means of protecting oneself and the fear of life and uh, so it's a mess but you know money is uh, a sort of a wonderful invention of humanity we used to exchange shells for services and but now we exchange this uh, digital mm. <laughs> zeros and ones <laughs> for our services and we we must participate in it in in real ways but we must distribute it to the people and feed the people because it's energy this is how we care for each other. And we've got to clean up this planet urgently in the next five years. We've got to take some very dramatic action to uh, cooperate with the ecosystems of Mother Nature. And this is all tied into our money systems. That, and, you know, leaders like you, we, you've got to get active now and turn money into relationship, <laughs> the honest exchange of energy. And to the question of the inability for beautiful people to find their equal and opposite, their polarity, with the three L's at present, to like, love, and lust in honest, real relationship as the life-revealing principle, you know, or dare I say it, the God-realizing principle, (laughs) the principle of love. Um, There's no requirement for it. First of all, I want to say that people who are single, they're sort of relieved of that whole, the work of healing humanity from this dreadful dysfunction that the patriarchy has put on us. You know, if you're naturally single, great. (laughs) Don't go there. Mm -hmm. But if you go there, uh, do a yoga practice of strength that is receiving. Do a simple asana, non-obsessive daily, actual and natural daily, like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, do your yoga. Do strength receiving, inhale, exhale as your asana. And that will give you the ability to become, to be receptive of your Mm -hmm. chosen partner, right? And if you don't have a partner, it will give you the ability to receive a partner of your choice. And there's billions of humans, and there's somebody for everybody if we become receptive. If we become receptive, then we have less fear, less anger, less pain around the whole uh, hurt of sex denial the denial of the feminine that is the norm of our societies created by religious doctrinal thought structure. So this this whole discussion is predicated on people knowing an actual yoga practice and doing an actual yoga practice, not the downtown gymnastics that's being called yoga, right, which is – something it's the fitness industry it's it is what it is you know it's the fashion industry it is what it is but there there was krishnamacharya who brought forth from the great tradition what yoga actually is what asana is hatha yoga strength 
strength receiving, the union of opposites in your own system. If you would do that, then it's a catalyst that makes relationship powerful and possible. And if you are single, I promise you, it's a catalyst that allows you to enter, should it be appropriate in your life, to enter into a suitable uh, collaboration with somebody else and that it must be there. If it's not there, then when we try to have relationship, all we are doing is duplicating the patterning mm-hmm. that society has put in place around sex. Yeah. And it's impossible. There must be an intervention of actual yoga practice. This actual yoga was there. It was how humanity actually had religious experience. You know, so Krishnamacharya's beautiful words that you know the Buddha was a yogi, <laughs> Christ was a yogi, that Jewish yoga master, <laughs> Christ, <laughs> yeah, who said, "Love thy neighbor as thyself." See, there was yoga. The, mm-hmm. the Veda is full of the Upanishads, and it's full of. It's all about yoga. Capital Y Yoga. Mm-hmm. Later came patriarchal doctrine that that stripped yoga from its uh, from its words, and it only became meaning. It only became an instrument of, of power. You know, everybody assuming themselves to be less than the great savior. You know. So this is what must happen now. We must really put yoga into society. And it's going to help. Mm. It's going to allow us to be cooperative with God, cooperative with Mother Nature in the tangible ways that Mother Nature is functioning, Mm -hmm. particularly in male-female collaboration, which is the nurturing power of life. Mm -hmm. It's the source of life. So for someone that is hearing that and going, yes, aha, they don't have the opportunity to get to a masterful class, such as yourself teaching. They're feeling unhappy. Mm. They're feeling a yearning to meet the perfect other. Mm. They don't want to be single, but they are. Yeah. And you're now saying, relax into being single and do your yoga practice. Yeah. What if it is just gymnastics available and a brief... High, which a lot of these experiences are, they 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 can be good for you. They can be good for you. They can get energy moving. You can get a brief high. But uh, could you maybe give just a brief breath exercise to help a listener that is trying to connect with them? That yeah. Is trying to connect what you're saying yeah. to well, what I want experience. to say about that in our yeah. interconnected world these days, where we're all everybody in the world. You know, even poor people have smartphones now all around the world, and, mm-hmm. and that's going to increase. And I'm saying that Google and Apple and Facebook will either kill us or they'll save us. <laughs> and this is why I'm, I put out apps. I have an app called I Promise mm-hmm. and, and another app called The Yoga Promise. And I've been delighted to find that people from all around the world can actually tangibly begin to practice. Through looking at a smartphone. So hop on. What what are they again? Can oh, you the promise? It's, it's called I promise. I like promise. iPhone, one word. Yeah. I promise. And this it's me doing it. You asked me to do a little demo, so I, <laughs> yeah, I just yeah. I don't want to sell an app. No. But please I do, do want to give yoga. Yeah, please do. To the world. And the other app is called the Yoga Promise. Mm-hmm. And it's a twenty one day course. And we also have online teacher training courses mm-hmm. that are very Useful, and you've got your two books as well. Yeah, and all of that, like mm-hmm. you know, and you know, I, this I admire you so much. As, you know, a young man in tandem with your beautiful Shakti, your feminine Joe, and going together and being in this world. You've really just gotten started in this matter, you know, mm-hmm. and it needs to be shown yeah, this union of opposites. If, I said, if the Pope had a wife of equal. Visibility, public visibility and teaching function and they were seen as equals and opposites, what culture would we have created? Mm-hmm. Or if the Dalai Lama had a wife who was seen as much as him. Yeah. Imagine the culture that we would have created in this right. world. But, you know, here we are in this time of humanity 
and here you are. And I'm very grateful for you uh, having a family, having a woman, having babies, and being the yogi that you are. Like, look at you flying from Perth to LA and then driving an hour across the town to see me. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, you're Nothing to be with you. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, you, well, your commitment to this <laughs> communication. You. I appreciate that. And putting out the books and the digital books and the apps and the online work. And this is, you know, and we need our help from our Facebook friends and Apple and, and Google and all this to give this to the people. You know, we either manipulate their minds with Google and Apple or we give something that is truly of human value which is intimacy with our own reality. Mm -hmm. And everybody can be intimate with their own life in this world, everybody in every country. Mm -hmm. This yoga of the ancient Veda is now available to all people everywhere, and it's our interconnectedness mm -hmm. that is going to give that to the people. So I'm very grateful that we have that capability now, and there's people like you, yogis like you, who are standing strong and standing on the shoulders of some great teachers like Ram Das and the Guru Parampara, the great ones that we have been with like Krishnamacharya and, and the great teachers of India just one generation back, you know, two generations back, Shirdi Sai Baba and uh, Ananda Mai Ma, these extraordinary people while Europe was in its dark fascism warfare, you know, and there was people like this. But now we're taking those gifts from the great tradition and bringing them into the public mind mm -hmm. uh, in real ways through this interconnectedness of digital technology. And we have that capability now of really bringing this world into, into um, salvation, into yeah. cooperation with reality cooperation with the ecosystems of Mother Nature and helping people come into real sexual intimacy with life and not denying it for some idea of some future improvement, you know, but being with our life as it is, mm -hmm. you know, intimacy with life as it is. Right. So to go to you, it's a simple matter of when I raise my arms, that opens the rib cage. Inhale and exhale, and the body movement is the breath movement. See, inhale, it opens the chest, more space in my lung cavity, and exhale like this. And the controlling center in yogic asana in movement is the throat, not the nostril. So it's not a muscular effort of try trying to inhale with effort. The effort, the uh, inhalation is the opposite of effort. It's to receive. <laughs> so I'm just making space in my lung cavity here. And with this, and the inhale is sounding the same as the exhale. I inhale above into the upper chest, receive right through the, to the base of the body. And on the exhale, it's strength from the base. And the exhale is an ascending movement. And the inhale is a descending movement. And asana is the union of above to below, of the descent with the ascent. We say a yogini synchronistically ascends and descends. You know, heaven and earth are one. Spirit takes form through this union of above to below is deeply in mystic traditions of many cultures. Yeah. So the other principle is that the breath envelops the movement. I exhale, then move. Right. I inhale, then move. And I'm still inhaling when the hands come together at the top of the inhalation. Four parts of the breath. So even just somebody standing in their room and doing this for a few minutes is very healing to the system. Very restorative. Just got to put down the phone for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> the mind, the way this yoga works is when I link the breath to the whole body, the mind automatically follows the breath. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the mind is linked to the whole body. And the whole body is God's creation. <laughs> the whole body is life. Mm -hmm. The whole body is the intelligence 
of, in, of infinity arising in tangible ways. So therefore, the intelligence that is life itself comes into my mind when I link the breath to the whole body. And it's really simple. Anybody can do it. Beautiful statement from Krishnamacharya. No one is restricted from yoga. Anyone who wants to can do a yoga practice that's right for them. Even if you're in a hospital bed and can't move, right? Remember those beautiful scenes with Ram Das mm. and he's had a stroke and he's in a wheelchair and I'm helping yeah. him go inhale and he mm-hmm. found it so helpful. You know, yeah. it's such a lovely friendship, you know, where he's just going inhale and exhale, simple movements and but it's very relieving for his body and his mm-hmm. mind to take some breath. There's power in the breath. You say if you're with your breath and you're with that which is breathing you. So this is some simple instruction that's on the app, the I Promise app. Exhale, then move. And inhale, receive from above all the way through the crown of the frontal line of the body all the way to the base. Then exhale from the base, this circle of energy like that. Thank you. And then that principle is in all the asana. I say it's in all of Mr. Iyengar's asana. Everything that's been popularized, you can put the principles that Krishnamacharya, the teacher of Mr. Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, the principles that Krishnamacharya was a scholar of and brought through into modern times. And his beautiful son, Deskachar, is so dutifully as a scientist, engineer, and a uh, uh, well accustomed to the ways of the West and the Western mind, he could express all this in in his uh, teaching, in his life of teaching. He died just last year. So this is available to us now, and these principles, if we put them into the yogas that have been popularized, that are more sort of male muscular gymnastics, uh, then your yoga becomes entirely your own. It becomes efficient and powerful and safe. Mm -hmm. And I ask everybody to look into that, to put the principles from the great tradition that Krishnamacharya brought forth and put them into the modern styles and brands. Mm -hmm. And then you're playing with a full pack of cards. It makes it possible for your yoga to be yoga, Mm -hmm. for your yoga is then a direct embrace of reality itself, the power of this cosmos that is arising as you and me, <laughs> and the trees, <laughs> and the sun, <laughs> and the moon. And the moon is receiving the sun and everything else, the earth and this body is receiving, you see. So receptivity is so important. The inhalation is so important in asana practice. And we, we actually say the asana is there for the breath, not the other way around. It's not like you're trying to do some gymnastics and breathing in it to help you do the gymnastics. Mm-hmm. No, the very purpose of the movement is this union of the inhale with the exhale. Beautiful. Thank you. What are your current views, if you have any, on, um, I don't think we've spoken about diet and nutrition. Do you have any any particular views? I mean, there's yeah. a common, again, the polarity of like the uh, the kind of austere way of fasting and limiting most foods yeah. and getting very, very clean and sattvic with the yeah. diet and then the other kind of tantric uh, take on diet of just, just eat anything and everything. So <laughs> same you, old problem. Yeah, right? same old problem. <laughs> one extreme, then the other. Exactly. Tr- try one extreme, then try the <laughs> yeah. other and neither work. Yeah, I say don't oblige food to make you happy, yeah. you know, but do uh, cooperate with Mother Nature. Mm-hmm. This body has a great intelligence with the green realm, Mm -hmm. (laughs) with Mother Nature and for nutrition, what we put into it. And uh, our great teacher, Krishnamacharya, would say 80% of our yoga problems are dietary problems. Mm -hmm. So just get your diet right. Mm -hmm. So much uh, sugar and carbohydrates are taken in our ordinary diet. So, you know, green plant protein, Mm -hmm. green, lots of green I think that's the way to go, but yeah. don't not to become obsessive with it. Obsessive. Don't oblige the food to make you enlightened, because there's no such thing as enlightenment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's just you know appropriate, optimal diet for the body's health and well-being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's pretty common as well. For the, uh, I've spoken quite a bit about this, and, and I fell victim to this as well. As soon as I started practicing yoga. I prematurely cut out meat, 
just too quickly mm-hmm. and because um, I thought I should. I'm mm-hmm. a yogi now. I shouldn't eat meat and just became a full green vegan, which is good. Mm-hmm. It's good conceptually. It's great and practically for the earth. It, it's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, some would argue that actually you can overdo the greens apparently right. um, that's hurting the earth apparently as well so any argument you can you can yeah. take route on but I definitely fell victim to that and I know a lot of new newer students do as well they feel and I felt I'm a yogi now got to cut out all meat all yeah. dairy vegan and it can often be done too prematurely yeah. and one can just bottom out and then before they know it they're at McDonald's having Bacon eggs. Pigging and tr- out. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, do you feel there, there's just a, a deep intelligence and balance there that you is know, a healthy thing to do? I don't mean to make light of it. I think we've got to give it some good attention mm-hmm. and work out what is our yeah. optimal diet and not do anything from an extreme point of view. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I agree with you that we need as humanity to trend. To not, no, it's more urgent, isn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. We've got to cooperate with the ecosystems of Mother Nature, and this meat industry is very much our problem. Mm. It's polluting the planet and polluting the body. And I also have strong feelings about animal cruelty Mm. that humans are perpetrating on other deer species, you know, and uh, not giving dignity to the other species that belong on this planet as much as we do you know i agree so i would say uh move uh, as quickly as the health of your body will allow to plant protein Mm. Uh, you can't do it dramatically it's a funny thing i'd tell you that my teacher deskachar who never had a drop of meat in his whole life but he was often putting his western students back onto people who had become uh, obsessed mm. with uh, vegetarianism. Uh, he, his view was that if you grew up in your childhood, adolescent years on animal protein, the body couldn't take. So as a pure Brahmin vegetarian, he would sometimes mm. recommend, but he would ask people to do it carefully and mm. then in time go to a vegetarian diet. Mm. And that's what I've feel is very helpful you know in longevity the whole thing the mediterranean diet you know in longevity for all of us yeah. all hu- humans you know is re- reduce sugar reduce carbohydrate reduce um, animal protein mm-hmm. really and urgently now mm-hmm. so we can all perhaps survive past 20 years let's see let's see I think we can if we all cooperate and we all start inhaling, exhaling, Mm. (laughs) strength receiving in life with this body and then possibly with somebody else of your choice. Do you have hope over the next 5, 10, 20 years that we're going to evolve into a healthy collaboration with one another? Yes, I think it's just the nature of of life. You know, you you are doing what... Everything that you can do. I see in your life you are doing everything that you can do. I'm doing everything that I can do. Committed to life. Committed to the source of life. Committed to all tangible conditions of life, you know. This is what we do. And now there is an urgency to it with climate chaos and all the rest. You know, we've got to get busy, stay busy. That busyness shouldn't destroy our life, you know. It's no good, you know, being a do-gooder if it kills you, you know. It's not that, you know, take care of this body so this body can take care of others. Like Sacred that. activism. Yeah. Mm. And yoga is activism. Yeah. It's the first act of ecology. Like, this is Mother Nature. This is the wild. Take care of this wild. Yeah. You know, and then go and feed. Well, it's a whole illusion, right, that we're separate from the Mother Earth. This whole uh, destruction of the Earth is Mm. coming from a destruction within. So, yeah, creating that union, creating that connection to love and joy within is totally crucial for us to truly, like, deeply start to treat each other well and the Earth well. Otherwise, it's just a a superficial mask. And I do go back to that is predicated on an actual yoga practice, mm. a daily 
non-obsessive, short Mm -hmm. yoga practice that each person can do in their own bedroom. There's more to this than we think. (laughs) Actual yoga. Well, that's a great place to leave it off. Listeners, check out Mark's links below. I'll put them below. He's got so many great bodies of work. Check out his books, his apps, his online content. There's so much. And he's regularly running retreats and teacher trainings and all kinds of courses and workshops all around the world. So if you're not already, hop onto the links below and stay in tune with Mark's work. Mark, it's been an absolute delight and pleasure to be with you again. Vice versa. Mm. Thank you for all you do for Mother Earth. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Much love, Mark. Much love, everyone. Till next time. (laughs) 